Amy, this is the Acting Secretary of Social Security. Second. Thank you. Discussion? All those in favor? That's approved. Our Secretary Treasurer, Mr. Orswell, is away today, as is Trustee Coleman and Assistant Superintendent Shanahan. And there are actually people supposed to be sitting in all these seats, and they'll be here. And the Director of Operations is away as well. So adoption of regular board meeting minutes for March 27th. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Those are carried. Adoption of today's agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? None. All those in favor? And that is carried. The board did have an in-camera meeting from 6 until just a little before 7. There are no presentation delegations this evening. There is no old business. Chair's report will go directly to Superintendent Elwood's reports. Thank you, Chairperson. I would refer the trustees and members of the gallery to the good news items. This is how we begin our board meetings, or how I begin board meetings. And it just highlights, and we certainly don't, by any stretch of the imagination, capture all the good things that go on from month to month in our school district. But these are some of the ones that have been shared with us. So we just wanted to talk and recognize about the fire camp, which is always an amazing experience for our secondary students. It's organized by the most part by our program workers in career education and Randy Gray. And the students that participate in that camp, not only do they learn skills about firefighting, more importantly, that camp is designed for them to learn skills about themselves. And it's a self-reflective kind of personal growth camp. And when you go to the graduation, which is always the most amazing experience, I recognize some of those young men and women that are there, and I am pleased to see them there because they are folks that perhaps march to a slightly different drummer than others do. And when they speak about their experience at the camp, they talk about what they learned about themselves, what they learned about teamwork, how they were so afraid when they started the camp that they wouldn't be able to finish. Because it really is a kind of, in our experience, an outward bound kind of personal journey, push yourself to your limits kind of adventure, all carefully guided by the RCMP and the fire department and other folks who volunteer their time. And they're there in long, long days and tough nights for a couple, three days. And when they graduate, those kids are smiling from ear to ear. And you're standing in the group with their proud parents, and their parents are saying things like, I never thought she'd finish. I never thought she'd even sign up. I never thought she'd finish. And we're so amazingly proud of them. So it's one of those great partnerships with the community that you can't put a value on because for lots of those kids, it's a life-changing activity. Because it makes them, it just makes them believe in themselves or it inspires a passion. Or in lots of cases, the RCMP camp, the firefight camp, they actually affirm a career choice for them. So it is a pretty amazing experience. And I've always encouraged trustees to go to the graduation if they have an opportunity. It very often and most often happens during our spring break. And so not everybody has access to it in terms of being able to go and have a look. But it certainly is a great experience. The other thing that's noted in the news memo, the Good News District Celebrations piece, is about the Destination Imagination. Once again, our district teams were very successful at Destination Imagination. In fact, we have three teams going to Knoxville, Tennessee at the end of May, which is a, that is the global competition. That's a pretty amazing achievement. And that's the second year in a row that we've had teams go south to the U.S. for that. So we, our kids always do well. But more importantly, they learn a ton about themselves again. And they learn a whole lot about the world because teams come from all over the world. And Destination Imagination is about team building. So it's a pretty great experience for them. And the last thing that I, because I know people can read through, well, actually there's a couple of things. If you were an elementary parent, you may have heard stories from your children two weeks ago where they came home, or a week just before spring break, where they came home talking about picking up garbage all over the community. And our elementary schools participated in a very big way in the Tim Hortons cleanup. 
That was organized by the Vice Principal uh, Tracy Cruden at uh, Nicole Potlidge Park, and we're grateful for her leadership. But what a great experience it was. They ran out of donut holes. Uh, at, in, in the valley. <laughs> Who knew? That the, because they were giving class sets of donut holes to all the classes that were participating. Timbits. They, Timbits, pardon me. They had no idea that there was going to be so many classes and they were so overwhelmed by the response. So that was kind of fun. And I think they, they picked up 150 or something like that bags of garbage and uh, got them all to the dump. So that was a good participation in a <coughs> nationwide cleanup that occurred during that week. Um, and of course, if anyone had the great opportunity, I know Trustee Grinham was there, um, had an opportunity to uh, experience once again the annual Heritage Fair on Friday at the uh, Armed Forces Base uh, with 175 students presenting their very best work. They had earned the right to be at the, um, the base at the Heritage Fair, the district one, by winning at their district, at their school level. And it's an amazing experience to be a judge and a parent uh, to go around and see the sophisticated, mature um, presentations that students from grade 3 through grade 12 make. It's just the most wondrous thing. And I was a judge, and as I was, uh, we were doing the initial um, sort of welcoming of the judges, I realized that I see many of these same folks judging year after year, and many of them came up to me later and said that they wouldn't miss it for the world. <coughs> these are folks who are retired military folk or retired business folk or retired educators who say that it's the highlight of the year to come and have a look at and listen to students who really know their stuff, are passionate about their uh, their area, their topic, and many of them are learning about their own family history. And it's a pretty moving experience to have a little one talk to you about their great great grandfather who uh, was persecuted in Russia and who smuggled, was smuggled out as a young child um, across the mountains to have a better life and eventually in Canada. It's a pretty moving experience to have this little person with this little round Canadian face tell you the story of their opa. It's pretty an amazing thing. I would always encourage people to attend. And finally, I'll highlight uh, an activity that is coming up on Thursday. Um, the school district, in partnership with the Community Justice Center at Marcusfeld, is proud to play a small part in hosting um, uh, its a dinner and then a, a workshop on the Friday and a, a night presentation on Thursday, April 26th. And that is from Dr. Abulash. He's the author of the book. It's quite famous right now, I Shall Not Hate. He's a gentleman who um, speaks about the death of his daughter in the Middle East and what he learned through that process and how, how you need, how he, his message is about breaking down the walls of cultural and religious uh, differences between us because the damage that it does to us as a society is immeasurable. And he had gotten to a place in his life where his anger had overtaken his life over the death of his daughter in the Middle East, in the middle of a sort of a, a racial diverse neighborhood, and he turned that into a positive message. And it's a, he's a, an amazing speaker. I have actually seen him myself. And he will be um, at Mark Isfeld from uh, 7.30 till 9 o'clock. And he's speaking on um, apology and forgiveness and how to move ahead after terrible things. And the best part of that is that our students at Mark Isfeld are going to be hosting that whole workshop and that presentation, not just in the evening, but as part of the, af the afternoon later. And some of those students will have the honor of attending those things as well. So I would encourage anybody, if you want to, Remember that there's a different life out there than in the Comox Valley and understand that our values um, about our children are the same no matter what religion we have or what our cultural differences are. He would be a person to go and listen to. So that's my good news. Thank you. Uh, comment. Uh, actually, a motion. I'd like to make a motion that the board send a, a letter off to the participating teams that... Uh, Participated in the um, destination imagination with our congratulations for their uh, representing our school district. Uh, I think it would be appropriate. I'll second that. Second. Any discussion? Just a quick comment. I happened to be on the ferry when those children and their principal and teachers came home. And just an amazing group of kids. Not only they were on the ferry, but a girls rugby team came in for provincials. And I hear that our Skills Canada group did extremely well, so a wonderful thank you to the teachers for supporting our students with some wonderful programs, and I definitely think a letter to the teachers also that support them would be part of that, I would hope. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion? And that is carried. Thank you. <coughs>
Or if you start sending congratulations to all of the others as well. I mean, we have so much achievement, we might have to hire another secretary to see what our kids are doing. Okay. And you want to... What I'd like to do, if that would be... Um, if that would be appropriate, I'd like to just uh, do a, a bit of a PowerPoint presentation with the help of my very uh, kind and very patient colleague, uh, Mr. Jeff Taylor, who manages all of my technology. He doesn't even let me go near it anymore. It's really <laughs> quite fun. Yeah, as soon as I walk towards the Smart table, man. can I help you? <laughs> Don't touch it because you'll muck it up. Um, oh, I'm not I'm doing that. Though. Are you yeah, sure? What am I it's just warm up. So I'm not doing the kind of joke, but remember I can hardly see, so I'm not going to laugh. Oh, there we go. Is anybody cold? Yes. We're waiting? We could shut the front door. Oh, D, it's locked, and so Dean was waiting until a quarter after 7 for a We weren't sure until we get more tips. I can see a few people going up this. So Shannon's yeah, just about... Yeah, it is just keep an eye on the door. So what do you think, Jeff? Do you think it's going to come? Well, you, well, you go ahead and start. Okay. And okay. <laughs> so I could um, give you a bit of a provincial update and then move to a little bit of a presentation on um, Bill 22. Um, just uh, as folks are aware, um, and this is just sort of for parents, particularly in the audience, uh, we will be working on report cards, uh, we, the Royal We, but uh, teachers will be working on report cards with principals and vice principals in schools this week. Um, the LRB made a ruling that there will be report cards ready to go out to parents on Monday at the end of the day. So, Monday, so this fall, this fall uh, week, uh, yesterday. Uh, so we will be working uh, together with teachers to make that happen. Uh, parents will be aware that uh, because this is a bit of a cumulative reporting process uh, dating back to September for us, at elementary you will look, you will find a, in most schools you will find a different reporting template. Um, it will be looked differently because we're looking to do it as reasonably, um, reasonable as we can for teachers and to provide you with an update that looks more like a checklist as opposed to the fulsome report card. Um, that you'll get in some schools, you may in some schools you may get a full summer report card simply because they were prepared prior to spring break. But in most schools, you will see at the elementary level there'll be a kindergarten template with a bit of a checklist on it, a uh, primary template with a checklist, and an intermediate one as well. Uh, those uh, those those will represent and bring us up to date uh, to Monday. April 30th, is that right? April 30th. And then as we move ahead for the rest of the, the remainder of the school year, in some instances there may be interim reports that are normally scheduled and they will occur. And of course there will be their usual final reporting in June. This will be for whom that is an issue. At secondary, um, parents should expect a computer generated report card through the, what we call fondly or not fondly BCESIS. Um, and it will have um, uh, marks from semester one and semester two, and they will be marks that look norm, look like you're used to, uh, percentages which generate letter grades. <laughs> in some instances, there will be work habits attached to them, um, and it's involuntary for teachers to produce comments or not. That's certainly up to them. But attendance will be on there, and it's meant to be a snapshot of where we were September 1st through till April 14th. So you should be asking your students particularly in secondary, um, to, for their report cards, and don't accept, oh, they're not doing them, um, or uh, don't accept, um, <laughs> oh, we haven't done, they haven't given them to us yet. It's our intention that report cards will go home um, on Monday, April 30th. And then um, I think that's kind of where we are. How are we doing, Jeff? Okay. And I'll, I'll start a little bit about, if I can, with or without the PowerPoint presentation, um, just talk a little bit about Bill 22. Um, Bill 22 is, as I was mentioning to a group uh, earlier, uh, Bill 22 is, in the history of British Columbia, another bill that speaks to either um, either the, a redirection in education or um, uh, a 
change in uh, strategy or a change in initiative from government. Um, some of us in this room have been in education for a very long time, nobody as long as Lord Douglas, but even he can remember that in his lifetime as an educator, and certainly I do, that in the course of the last 25 years, 25 to 30 years in British Columbia, there's been a series of bills, Bill 17, Bill 19, now Bill 22, that have been government's um, either response to an educational shift or uh, uh, government, a government and different governments of the day, not one government in particular. They, a bill can often in British Columbia can be a declaration of direction, of a change in direction. And Bill 22, in many ways, is a hybrid of both, I would say to you. And so um, i just share with you a little bit about Bill 22. There are two parts in I would say, if I was explaining this to somebody from another planet, um, there are two parts to Bill 22. Part one is actually speaks to and is, I would say, a response to um, the government's response to labor, the labor landscape right now, the, the current labor landscape. And part two is about, uh, I think it's both a declaration of a change in direction from government and it's a bit of a map or a bit of a blueprint about how they're going to look at structures, structures differently. And of course, part two also is um, a response to um, a Supreme, BC Supreme Court challenge around Bill 27 and 28, in which the judge ruled that the government needed to respond um, to uh, errors in that process. And so part of what is contained in Bill 22 is the government's response to the challenge of Bill 27 and Bill 28. So Cole's Notes version is, part one is about the labor landscape. It has a finite lifetime. Bill 22 came into existence um, not exactly in its entirety. It's taken a couple of three weeks. Every week there's another little bit that sort of uh, gets attached to it as it gets in front of government in the House. Um, but Bill 22 became alive on April 14th, and parts of it will be done on August 31st, 2013. The, the general brushstroke of that would be it's the labor parts that will be done at the end of August uh, 2013 and in anticipation of uh, another round of provincial collective bargaining. So some things that are spoken to about in Bill 22 will be um, will be be finished or completed and there will be an expectation that further conversations about that occurs at the provincial bargaining table between the BCTF and the government of the day and it will lift some things out of Bill 22 back onto the collective bargaining table for teachers and government to sort through and decide what they're going to do. So those are things like class sizes, the local, the, dip, the split between local and provincial issues, those kinds of things. So it has been described by both government, government, government and media as a cooling off period. And so part one, which is the education services continuation, is the piece that speaks directly to the kinds of things that we're living in right now. Now, Jeff, I just... Okay. So... So the cooling off period simply means, and this is just the language, this isn't our, this isn't a, this is a, from my perspective, a neutral uh, presentation. I'm simply telling you what is in the, contained within the bill. Um, and remembering that this is a government bill, it didn't come from the TF and it didn't come from BCPC, it came from government. Um, and it um, exists in life through government and through government discussion on the floor, it was passed. So the first part speaks in its majority to that this is a cooling off period until um, August 31st, probably 2012. There's a piece that speaks to 2013 embedded in it as well, um, that there are to be no strikes or lockouts, that, um, that uh, a new collective agreement is actually, uh, this is actually not a return to work, a legislative return to work, in the sense of it's, it's actually returning a new collective agreement. There is no new collective agreement. This is simply a cooling off period within the current collective agreement. That's important to, to remember because the, sec the next part of that is it speaks to um, that once this came into being, that we need to go back, both sides, parties must go back and continue bargaining. So they're bargaining in the hopes of receiving a new collective agreement. Where in the past, some bills have imposed a new collective agreement, we are still living inside of the collective agreement that currently exists with, items, with, with the idea that the bargaining will continue. Part of the hope around bargaining continuing is the fact that the government has within Bill 22 
spoken to the appointment of a mediator, and these are the terms of reference for the mediator, and it would be that the mediator would be um, would um, would work towards a collective agreement, and that's what CA means, a collective agreement that would be a two-year term or mandate would take us through to June 30th of, of 2013. That mandate must be met within the net zero mandate. Um, that this agreement would uh, enable the, the criteria around high quality teaching and learning, the kind of effective feedback and evaluation, uh, alignment of ProD with teaching needs, and scheduling selection of teachers suited to student needs. These are the platforms that the government would expect the mediator to uh, broker with the TF or not, but would expect to uh, receive feedback from the TF on those particular items in addition to other items as well. But those are the sort of the critical benchmarks uh, for a mediator to uh, attempt to engage BCPC and BCTF in discussion. All of this is subject to PELRA, which is an overarching document and piece of legislation that speaks to the ability to add additional matters locally if they don't affect any other school districts. So uh, there, this means that if it was appropriate, school districts could, we used to call it mid-contract modification, but they could bargain something locally um, in addition to what's going on at the provincial table as long as they do not affect any other school district and would be more effectively negotiated locally. And there are some districts, particularly some of the northern rural districts, where there are specific things in their collective agreements that are about everything from weather, you know, how many, you know, what do you do when you, you could be on day 22 with a snow day, or um, in some districts they have some particular agreements within their collective um, their, their, their contract around teachers being paid to travel on ferries to get to work and those kinds of things. So if there was something that was specifically so unique to a local, they could, um, they could work on that together to come up with a, something that's local as long as, because it wouldn't affect anybody else. It also speaks to some of the restrictions um, and it speaks to about, um, it means that uh, uh, this one talks about how a local wouldn't be able to do something different around class size and composition um, or change ratios at the non-enrolling level. So those are things like it for counselors and learning assistance teacher, teachers because it speaks to some language around making sure that you don't upset uh, what's already been bargained in locally um, and that there is some provincial standard around those. And um, it's, a, it's, it's two clauses that speak to that. It's just based basically around making sure that uh, what you are agreeing to um, both at the provincial level and at the local level, don't end up imposing something on a district that already has particularly good language around that. Um, on or before June 30th of 2012, which is like fairly soon, um, it's a couple months away, uh, the, the mediator would advise the Minister of Education about how far along in the process they've gotten, what kind of progress had been made, if there had been areas that they were that were there was an ability to make some kind of agreement on, or if there were uh, areas that there weren't, and that is so that um, the government can have some kind of benchmark about how the summer might go, and how close to a collective agreement, a new one, that that there is a possibility of getting to. This is something that um, uh, it, it has actually not been um, invoked yet. This has not been um, voted on at this point in time, and has not been certainly uh, made alive, but. Part of what this was about, that um, there will be fines for both sides of bargaining, not just the TF, but BCPC as well, or districts, if they were somehow being obstreperous or blocking um, what's laid out in Bill 22 in terms of the cooling off period, um, so that there would be some uh, financial, I'm assuming this is meant to be a financial um, response to someone not following through on the provisions that are in Bill 22. And as you can see, these are... Um, the, the, I've, I've been told these are the extremes, up to $2,500 a day, up to $475 a day. And because it has not been enacted, there's not a whole lot of clarity about who actually rules on that. Um, if it is somebody out of the uh, Attorney General's office, if it's out of the Labor Relations Board, that this was, uh, I'm assuming, was put in place so that people would understand um, would understand the consequences of not following through with Bill 22. And if you'll know, it's teachers, the DCTF, BCPC as well, districts as well. So it's everybody involved, not just one side or the other. But they haven't pushed this through 
think this has not been settled yet. Um, they're talking about um, what may, what damages might be caused if you actually violate this. And of course, because this came, this is actually a piece of law. Um, if for some reason there was some need to um, to restrain somebody who is uh, not in compliance with Bill 22 or prevent them from further perpetuating that, this could, so like a district say, if we decided we were just going to ignore the whole thing, uh, we could be taken to court. And I would be assuming it would be the board chair and myself. <laughs> the same, that would be you and me. We would be somewhere. I know. Yeah. I look particularly good in orange, is what I think. <laughs> so, the other, so one of the other parts about this is just this is about um, that there is a hope that after April 14th that the provincial parties would get back to a bargaining table and that they would work together to find um, a provincial agreement. And I would say to you that I, it's my belief that that, that that hasn't begun yet. I'm not aware that that is going on at this point in time. This is just some stuff about provincial parties. I'm going to move more quickly because I always talk too much and too quickly. This speaks to the, uh, some of the other parts inside about staff admissions. So one of the important things for parents and certainly for the community and for teachers is the, is the changes that have come about through Bill 22 around class size. And so one of the things that we, you've heard me, particularly in September, speak to is the district aggregate. It was a piece of legislation that forced districts to staff and maintain always through the school year a district average, and they were set averages. And in order to do so, to be totally fair, uh, it became quite a bean-counting, bureaucratic, uh, non-educationally based decision-making exercise where we very often were spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in staffing in schools that didn't necessarily need the staffing or want the staffing. We would be placing a teacher here in a grade three class and they in that, class, in that particular school didn't necessarily have a need for a grade three teacher. But in order to reduce the district aggregate mathematically, simply mathematically, that was the best place to, to place that teacher and that district aggregate has been removed. And so that's what they're talking about in district averages. So we no longer have to staff to a district aggregate. And that's very good news. It came about from pressure from everybody, the BCTF, BC School Trustees Association, BC Superintendents Association, because everyone understood that it was not educationally sound uh, and it was extremely expensive. In large districts, they could spend up to a million dollars just trying to keep the aggregate under 0.1% of what it could be. Because we learned the hard way that one full-time teacher saved you about 0.01% of the decimal point to get you under. And so if you were looking to move by 0.5, if you were to go from 19.5 at kindergarten where you could be, to get it to 19, it would cost you a half a million dollars. And it wasn't, it wasn't an appropriate way to be using your money. So that is gone. Class sizes that, that we have always existed under remain K to 3. Those numbers, those class sizes are the same. Um, there's a bit of change. Bill 33 is also going, and you will see much tap dancing on the part of, I hope, teachers and certainly principals and vice principals, particularly around the consultation that was required with Bill 33. So Bill 33 is gone as well. Um, and so those are good news things, I believe, for the system. And the question now is that, um, can, what we need to do is develop a consultation process with teachers um, that has integrity and that is about student-centered learning and it's students at the center of the decision making. So that, that I would say is a good news thing. Instead, where we are right now, for the, um, for the first time in formal language in a bill, grades 4 through 12 may not go over 30 if, unless, in the opinion of the superintendent, the principal, the class is um, appropriate for that, or the class is in a prescribed category. So just for music teachers, don't panic. Of course, for music, it's appropriate for a class to go over 30, and there will be exemptions to this that are about you need a larger, broader uh, group to have a good learning environment. But the change for us is that, particularly for grade 8 through 12, we've never in this district for uh, for, I think Lord Douglas can only remember once, ever staffed more than 30 at elementary, and, and right now even kindergarten to grade 7 in this elementary model. Um, but we have 
on some occasions, staffed over 30 at secondary. And now we will not be able to do that unless we provide compensation for those teachers for each child over 30. So for the 31st child, that teacher will receive um, uh, compensation. And that compensation can take its, uh, for its form differently. It can be financially, monetarily. It can be in release time. It can be in professional development time. Um, and it could be, in certain cases, in uh, request for particular resources that they might want to access or particular training that we might be able to access for them. So that's a change for us um, in that we will, uh, we will look to staff at 30 grades 8 through 12. The reporting requirements, that's Bill 33 reporting requirements are removed. The oversight provisions are removed. And uh, the regulation that's come in is speaks to now these set classes at 30 um, and how we need to compensate teachers and how we need to consult with teachers. There's, a, 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 I believe, a really good emphasis on consultation with teachers in the spring. We always did consult, consult with teachers in the spring, particularly at elementary in the organization of classes. And it was never, we couldn't use that consultation for Bill 33 purposes. You had to sort of ignore the fact that you'd done all that in the spring and you'd have to go through this very rigorous uh, two-week um, consultation process, September, middle of September till the end of September. This is um, requiring, and rightly so, good consultation processes that have integrity, that can take place in the spring as classes are built and constructed in elementary for September and as students are programmed in secondary into classes. Uh, teachers and principals will work together to ensure that we've got um, kids in the right places for the right reasons and the, uh, the, uh, the appropriate resources that we can bring to bear for those classes. And that consultation will be important because, of course, the, next, the other big part of this, and I'm going to move quickly now, is the LIFT fund, and that's the, which, is, um, which is new. This is an additional amounts of money originally uh, forecasted to be $30 million this year, $65 million next year, and uh, for, for the year, no, I mean $30 million this year, $60 million next year, and then possibly even higher for the remaining years for, for perpetuity. And that's a fund that will be given to districts. It's based on a formula, based on enrollment, and where we can use that once we've spent our operating monies to the best of our abilities, supporting learning in classrooms. That's everything from teacher staffing, that's our operating money. Spend our operating money for teacher staffing and EA staffing. Then being able to look at the Learning Improvement Fund in consultation with the uh, principals will consult with teachers. Principals will then uh, draw up a plan for that, the use of those funds. Um, work with me and Alan and Sheila appropriately with those funds. And I would work with the president of the local teachers association, Steve, and we would look to spend the funds from that, um, from those monies. We can. The good news is that they're going to upfront that money to us. The bulk of which we can spend 70% of our allocation now in the spring, moving towards the end of June, to have things in place for September, and we'll be able to have save a little bit back for those surprises that come in September. Students who are new to the district, those kinds of things. But what it would mean, what it will mean, is that we'll be able to. Um, help more of our vulnerable students and our, and, no, and not just students who are designated. And I think that's important for people to know. They do not ne necessarily need to be special needs designated students. We all know that there are students who are not designated who need support. And we didn't ever receive funding for them in the past. And this is the kind of fund that we can use to make that happen for them. So that's just a piece of So. What it signals are some good and positive changes in terms of um, moving ahead. I think in part of this will be about supporting the, the ministry's ed plan. Some of this is challenging for all of us, and I think it's important that we work together to work through the, the pieces that have the creases and the wrinkles in. We'll be working with the local teachers association and the QP. Part of the lift fund is there's a bit of a, there has been a commitment on the part of government. I think it appears as an appendix to Bill 22 that a certain portion of the lift fund will be for QP staffing, for support staff, and so we'll work with QP as well. But the idea is that Bill 22 has two purposes. One is around managing the labor landscape from the government's perspective, and the other is about signaling some new directions. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other things that are contained in them that are the kind of housekeeping things that speak to school calendar and flexibility and all of those things. And I'll just keep you apprised because the bill's not finished yet. 
and I suspect in the next course of the next month we'll have there'll be additions to the bill until it's finally Trustees, any questions? I have a couple, if I may. Um, on the compensation issue for teachers, yes. for the over 30 um, students, um, is the, should a teacher find themselves in that position, is the compensation choice theirs? Or, yes. So that's theirs. Um, will, it, will teachers have, in the province, have the opportunity to say, uh, no thanks, I don't want to go over 30? Y yes. Uh, in fact, they, they, the assumption, that's the default position. We have to be asking for a teacher to go over 30. So, so teachers can say? It's my understanding that, yeah, that they can, and we certainly wouldn't want to be placing it. There would be a rare occasion where we would be having to place a student over 30, perhaps at, 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 against the wishes of a teacher, and we haven't worked that piece through. Um, we, what, we, what we anticipate is through a consultation process, we would, the school-based principal would determine with, say, if there's two grade 7 teachers and then another grade 7 student moves into the mix and both classes are at 30, there would be a genuine conversation with both teachers about where is the best placement for that 31st child in consideration of the class composition of those two grade 7 classrooms. So, um, I know some of the regulations are just starting to come out, and I was attending that meeting in Vancouver when the ministry was speaking, and what I recollect and what I recall, and I just want some clarification on that there, the regulations that come out, they said, am I correct, in, the, in assuming that if there was something wrong, if they were not working, they would be willing to relook at those regulations and, and come back with some, that was a question that was asked, and I think what that I heard... I think what I and I think I heard similar. What I heard is that there will be review, a review of Bill 22, the various parts of the regulation, and there is a willingness on the part of the ministry, not the ministry, the government, to have a look at uh, the the implementation after the, impl the initial implementation. Um, if it's actually if their feedback they're receiving, this is what George Abbott said, um, is that what had originally been intended is not occurring. They would be willing to have a look at that again once it's been implemented and, and it's gotten over its usual implementation hurdles. Change is hard for folks, right? So it, I, I think what I heard him say is that, yes, there was a willingness to review that. Understanding that for the most part, three-quarters of Bill 22 will not be fully implemented, will not even begin to be implemented until next school year. Because we're, we're living still in without Bill 22. We, we're not, like, if a, if a 31st child arrived today, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be dealing with Bill 22 if the idea is that it starts, those kinds of things start in the next school year. Any additional questions? Um, well, I have, I have two questions. One is um, whether you think this makes, it gives us more flexibility around issues that, like, it's still, it's still those 20th century learning boxed kids of the same age in the cl class. Is, you know, it doesn't seem to me to move towards multi-age groupings and team teaching and those things. Is this going to have any changes around new initiatives that would be looking at that or not? I actually don't think that there's anything in this that would prevent us from doing exactly what we want to do. Uh -huh. This is about, th this doesn't say 30 grade fives. It could be 30 multi-age kids. Mm -hmm. And we spoke specifically to the minister about that, um, and I did. And this is not meant to prevent, in fact, it's meant to ease uh, the, new, the new initiatives around looking at s structures differently. Mm. So this doesn't read like 30 grade fives. It deliberately doesn't. It speaks to multi-age groupings. Now, what we've learned around this kind of language is that you would go, that you default to the, the class size that's attached to the youngest grade within the grouping. Yeah. Ergo, that makes lots of sense to us. Yeah. That, that's just fair. So I don't see that this is, is binding, shackling us. In fact, it, there are some parts of it about not having to do some of the Bill 33 stuff and all those other things that is actually liberating. Mm, okay. And it don't, I don't see this as a hindrance at all. It's, so the other piece is the, the announcement about uh, new about a task force looking at rural education and the specific yep, needs of that. Is that be tying in with this? It's not. Bill 22 it's, or is that a it doesn't look to me like it's tied to Bill 22. So there was an announcement uh, last week 
about a task force that's looking at rural, rural education and certainly looking at um, partly spurred, I, I would believe, and, and rightly so, by the fact that we have many small communities in rural, in rural areas, not just north, actually, because, of course, it's, getting, it's, it's coming south, in the, we're in such declining enrollment that it's just sucking the life out of their school systems, their public education systems. And, it, uh, and some of what was going on for those schools, they were becoming so small that they were either being closed because they couldn't be financially supported by their districts, or there are some times when you look at the, a cohort in a school and it's so small, multi-age, that you can't do anything meaningful mm -hmm. um, around curriculum because you might have 47 students in seven grades. And, and we, we, we struggle a little bit with that on the island. <coughs> and so this rural, this is part of where this is coming from, is looking at new ways of building different kinds of structures in rural communities for public education and freeing them up from some of the things that bind them um, to having to make some tough decisions about closing schools when they'd rather not. That's, what the, that's where it came from. So not linked to the bill. Not to the bill, not linked to the bill, yeah. independent okay. of that. Okay. Great. okay, and the last question I have is regarding the school calendar and the fact that that's now giving districts more flexibility. It gives us more flexibility, but it also reminds us that in some districts, uh, I didn't realize this, I have to be, this is my naivety, in some districts um, where either they weren't paying attention to the collective agreements that they have with their uh, support staff and their teachers, or they don't have language in those districts uh, in their collective agreements for their support staff and their teachers, that the bill is really clear that, there's a, that if there is collective agreement language, um, in support staff and teacher contracts, that you must, a uh, board must, uh, must fulfill that language as part of a local calendar conversation. Where, but there were some binding pieces in the school act around the calendar um, that they have lifted. So it does absolutely and was intended to give local planning and local decision making to school districts around the school calendar and it, it not being bound by a provincial standard calendar like we have been. But it also reminds us that if there is collective agreement language, you need to make sure you fulfill that language. So my understanding at that meeting is that the ministry was really looking at a balanced school calendar. Is that something that they just are going to support districts in looking at, or is that something that they're trying to? And this is where I yeah. was. I was kind of I heard it one way, but I might have heard it wrong. Are they supporting districts that are looking at a balanced school calendar, or is the ministry looking at a balanced school calendar as part of where we want to go with flexibility and with that 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 process? And that's where I okay. I was at the same meeting. I would say, Trustee Kate and I heard it a little bit differently. Okay, that's why I was. Um, I heard that the ministry is supporting local autonomy around calendars. Okay. Period. And I and they're no disrespect, but they're politicians. And they don't want to be seen to be supporting one initiative or over another. Um, I didn't hear them coming out and saying that they were supporting balanced calendars. What they said was that they would support um, local districts, and if they explore things like balanced calendars or learning cycles or 10-month cycles inside a 12-month year that look different, those are the kind of initiatives that they hoped districts would explore locally but it wasn't that they were pinning their hat on a balanced calendar specifically. And in fact, they were dancing not to be seen to be supporting one or another. Thanks for the clarification. I just I missed that one. Thanks. Okay. That's it. Thank, you. Thank you for that presentation. We'll move on to the inquiry and updates. Um, just again, um, I, uh, I had shared, I think, at a previous board meeting that um, the person that we had hired, the lawyer we had hired to fill the inquiry had been very ill. and. I uh, have shared um, that uh, she's actually been extremely seriously ill. Her inquiry is almost complete, but she is um, physically unwell, so unwell that she's not, wasn't able to provide it for me for this board meeting. I spoke to her on Sunday, and she, I certainly will have it within the next week or so, um, but she had been hospitalized and had been unable to work on it for the last three weeks. So I will continue with this, um, and she's feeling extremely bad about it. But that's where we are. Thank you. So the uh, board authority authorized course offer. I still move that the board approve the board offer the bar courses as presented to be offered to students in the district of the respective secondary schools. Second. 
Before we go into any discussion for the new trustees, are you familiar with this? Do you need a little bit of a context or background to these bar cases? I've read through the case. No, this right here. No, I've read it. Okay. Not sure. Any discussion? I just think it's great, the opportunity to offer our students and the crime media and the culture, the CSI course that Notre Dame offers. I want to see who they murder next year. I think it's just amazing that it was murdered. Anyways, I just think it's amazing that we talk about student engagement and these are courses that will get our students engaged and keep them in school. And I'm just thrilled that our district is able to provide those courses for them. Any questions at all? Once these are approved, are they then, can a similar course be, you know, they become the basis that they could be used at a different high school as well? Yes, absolutely. It's district-wide and province-wide. People coach all the time. Good. Mr. Gray? Yeah, I just, my comment is it's refreshing to see educational variety for certainly our high school students as they go forward because I think it's important that they create programs that they're interested in that keeps them in school. And so they have the opportunity to graduate. So well done to those teachers and schools who develop those courses. I just wanted to add that I think it really shows the initiative within our educators and really compliment the leads in all three of these courses for putting the time and the energy forward to making the proposal. So all those in favor of the motion? And that's passed unanimously. Thank you. The Secretary of Treasury. Okay, just to provide the public and the board, the public will stay tuned with the update of the budget process to date. Obviously, we're moving along with the funding announcements that we received in March 13th this year. Further information about the BIP funds, about the education guarantee programming. But certainly we have preliminary budget projections that indicate that we will be running in the area of a shortfall of $1.3 to $1.7 million. Again, a lot of it's prefaced with still looking for information on the education guarantee program, which is the adult grad program that's being offered through DL. So we're just looking for some more information that the ministry is working towards, basically fine-tuning what that program will look like next year. With our staffing timelines and our collective agreement processes, we're still moving forward on our staffing schedule. That includes staff adjustments to reflect the projected enrollment of about, or decline, of about 175 students projected for September 30th. In the meantime, knowing the shortfall that we're facing, administration is considering other adjustments to offset the shortfall. Areas that are being considered are teacher staffing, support staffing, admin staffing, admin level sort of thing. Program efficiencies are being looked at, whether they be from the operations perspective or finance areas, departments, as well as supply accounts that are being allocated to schools on a regular basis. They are being looked at. Consultation timelines, we're sort of, as we go through, we're looking at an internal group. The stakeholders themselves will be consulted upon the week of May 1st to the 8th. Then we'll proceed with the public consultation process May 8th, 9th through the 11th. And what we'll be doing is as the, as specific dates, times, locations get crafted, as it were, obviously we'll put the message out, whether it be through the DPACs and the PACs, as well as on our website, there's always going to be a wealth of information in terms of what process we're following along. So like I said, we're going to be engaging in an internal with the stakeholder groups, which will include QP, teachers, the local teachers, BC, I guess what we call them, principals and vice principals, as well as ESPA, the school staff. And then a public consultation a couple of nights ago. From there we proceed into in-camera discussions with the board, followed by a finance committee sort of making the final 
recommendations I've been brought forward to the May 22nd board meeting at which time the approval of the budget gets uh, presented uh, for final approval. That's the site. Any questions? Any comments? Um, I have a question. Um, the, uh, the range that you provided, the 1.3 to 1.7, and then you talked about that the ministry is still looking at the specifics around. So is that, will there be a swing in the 1.3 to 1, does that account for the 1.3 to 1.7? Correct. Why the range is because we don't know the impact of education guarantee. The 1.7 is a worst case scenario. The 1.3 is a better case scenario. I think I'm not clear about whether this is taking into account the, the redu reduced number of students. So are we saying that 80% or just about our staffing costs of this will be related to the reduction of the number of students? Or is this after? This is after the students have been in. This is after knowledge that the staffing needs to be adjusted for the reduced students. And certainly, um, the thoughts of, of administration. Obviously, we've got a super, we've got an operating surplus of 2.1 going into this year, so we know that we can uh, cushion, if you want, uh, the impact for next year because we have those funds. Um, that's sort of the stabilizing uh, force that we've always built into our budgeting system over the last five years. Uh, we've had the benefit of um, uh, of making services for capital pur uh, purposes, but we've also had the benefit of being able to do this reduced, um, I think we've always kind of called it a controlled landing, if you want, uh, that, that cushions some of these blows that we know are going to be felt for the reduced staff or for the reduced um, enrollment. That's going to be felt till about 2014-15 uh, sort of thing, and then basically we're not going to see the same declines year after year after year. So we're going to stabilize. We'll maintain about a cohort of a 510 students per grade, effectively. We're not going to see the 700 graduating anymore, kind of thing. Um, so we won't have to balance that uh, graduating class versus the incoming class of about 180 students. We don't have to maintain that decline anymore. So it balances out in about five or four years. Um, depending on birth rates and you know those sorts of things, and you can the economics of our, our, our local economy. But this is a, I mean, if you're talking about a million dollars, this, this is not just a few district positions, most of which are already this is significant. or a you know dance out. This is cutting almost everything we do. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Ron. And we want to in the middle of this. I'm going to have a list of the time this month. I have Jerry Sandow, who's here, who's retired in the back of the government, has a job for 31 years of service, and they must give it to us way in advance. Uh, Jerry McIntyre, who teaches at Knights, will retire June 30th, after the end of 27 years of service in the district. The the vice principal of the Jersey Secondary School will retire as July 31st after 23 years of service to the district. And John Lamb of EA will retire June 28th after 10 years of service to the district. And all of those retirees will be honored at the board function for the last year. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to receive management report. Seconded. Thank you, Trustee Drew. All those in favor? Very we move on to board committee reports. Finance committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, um, because of the um, two-week uh, break, uh, we were unable to hold our finance committee, so we held it last Friday. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why you don't have the committee report in front of you, and it's my apologies for that. Uh, secondly, um, Peter Coleman wasn't available, he's in England, and uh, our alternate uh, 
Trustee uh, Gamacorda wasn't available as well. So I would like to thank Janice, uh, Trustee uh, Caton, uh, who stepped into the breach and attended the meeting, uh, which made it much more uh, effective meeting, uh, a finance meeting. Um, I guess the issue is, is that perhaps for trustees and for the public, we're looking at a status quo budget. What we're trying to do is balance it off. Uh, and I guess uh, the issues are that we're, we're wrestling with is enrollment decline, funding formula changes, pullback effects, funding protection, uh, and educational guarantee, which is the adult component to that. Um, and certainly, uh, as you heard from the superintendent, there is going to be a fund out there called Learning Improvement Fund. That doesn't come into effect until you've used all of your own resources, so as long as you're clear about that. Uh, but our partner groups that we will be talking to um, include the prison uh, principals, vice principals, CDTA, QP, DPAC, uh, and ESPA. Uh, and then the public meetings, as uh, uh, Mr. Amos has uh, said, uh, between the 9th and 11th we'll have public meetings. Uh, and so we will gather all that information and then we will have, um, with uh, attached to the Education Committee meeting, a uh, trustee meeting on, on the finances to go through, sift through that process, have our finance meeting on the 14th of May, and we'll be bringing the budget to you on the 21st. And if there is a uh, feeling that uh, there needs to be another meeting for the board prior to the 22nd, we'll be happy to do that as well. And that's my report. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we want a policy advisory committee. Uh, yeah, uh, we had our last meeting on March 27th, right before our board meeting. Um, and the minutes are attached. And we, we have policies to rescind as well as Revisions and in the absence of super, Assistant Superintendent Sheila Shanahan, I understand uh, Superintendent Elwood and Linda Marie will. Yeah, we should be good for this. So, what I'd like to do with the Chairperson is to turn uh, the, the bulk of this is HR policy, and Linda Marie, as our Director of Human Resources, has done the bulk of the work on it. So, Linda Marie, would you mind walking us through? A little bit, each of those. Well, uh, in terms of the, just the, the categories and um, answering any questions that folks might have. Uh, certainly, we have um, in terms of the, we have a series that are policies uh, to be rescinded uh, that are uh, old and outdated and no longer uh, applicable or relevant to our practice. Uh, so that is the list that we're rescinded, and then we have a list of policies for revisions. Uh, many words you can just update the language for something as personal files, which uh, have been from 1980, doesn't fit the personnel files, believe it or not. <laughs> so we have to connect a lot of the language and kind of update some of the information uh, to reflect current practice uh, and modernize some of those archaic uh, policies because we don't review them very often. So that's that in a nutshell without having to go through them one at the time, but happy to answer any questions. So what I'm wondering is, given that there's two motions, one linked to the rescinds and one to the revisions, perhaps we could start with the rescinds and I'll sort of open the floor to, for trustees who've had an opportunity to review this. Are there any specific questions from the uh, three policies that are there to be rescinded? Trustee Kate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, these, I see, are dealing with uh, QP, some of them. I like to know, and um, teachers, were they present during that process and are they comfortable with the rescinding of these policies and do and that process is, is fine with them? Do we have members of the policy committee that were in attendance and those were also discussed in our management liaison committees with those groups. And they're fine with them. Perfect. They have yeah. provided their input. Okay. So I make a motion that the board rescind policy 5001MR1, hiring of unionized support staff. Policy 3015 MR1 medical certificates and policy 4022 teachers on call as presented. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? 
Just for clarification for the public, the spirit and the intent of the important pieces of these policies are captured elsewhere, which is to a large degree. So this is not a, we're no longer interested in the issues around hiring a United Support staff. It's just covered through other mechanisms. That is correct. So I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Again, same question for the policies that are listed there for revision. And there are eight of them. Seven of them. Just for clarification, and maybe through you, Mr. Chair, Secretary Treasurer, is it possible that we can deal with these individually? There's one of them regarding the trustee travel and budget. I talked to Assistant Superintendent Sheila Shanahan, and there was a revision to be done with that. So I'm wondering, is it okay if we can do them separately? Because I believe there's another one I have a question with respect, rather than doing them individually. Is that, would that be acceptable through our procedure? You can certainly pull them out. Yeah, we can pull them out. Okay. I'll endeavor to keep score. So I make a motion the Board adopt Policy 2021, Access to Personal Files, and Policy 3015, Medical Certificates. I believe they're related to each other, so I'm comfortable with those two. Second. Okay. So, Deb, are you following that? We're breaking these into order. Okay. There's a seconder. Any discussion? Rick? Yeah. Policy 2021, I notice that it's restricted to access to the file. I'm just a little concerned. Are they the ones that are going to maintain the files? It just reflects what's been happening for the last 10 years. Okay. It's just cleaned up. This was very old from 1988. Yeah. I'm just thinking the staffing level identified the appropriate staff that they have to have access to the file as well. But it's not shown in here. Which appropriate staff? Well, it says the Director of Human Resources, Secretary of Treasury, Superintendent of Schools, and Assistant Superintendent. And then the employee themselves have access to it. And five? Any supervisor, staff, or employees of all positions? Thank you. I've seen the line in the beginning. Okay. That's all right. Read the whole sentence. That's all right. Okay. Thank you. Keep reading. So I would like to suggest that we have this motion on for these first two policies, but I think then subsequently if you have an opportunity to sort of lead us through each of the ones. We'd be happy to. That would be, I think, smoother. So we'll have. Is there any other discussion on the first motion which covers the first two policies? Being none, all those in favor of the motion? And that's carried unanimously. So perhaps, Ms. Marie, if we could start with 3065R1. So that's the harassment prevention policy. And this one was just to clean up, to have it reflecting that the superintendent of schools are designated, and also adding that if there was involvement with the superintendent of schools, they would go to the board chair. So this was just reflecting, cleaning up the language so it's easier for people to know who to go to if there was an actual complaint. And it's essentially all of the details of what's to clean up the word board and superintendent of schools versus secretary, treasurer, assistant superintendent, listing a whole bunch. So that's all there is in terms of change. It's just an update. Those are all just clean up. Any questions on that policy? I'll make a motion to adopt. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the revision to policy 3065R1? All those in favor? Any none opposed? So that's carried. Okay, policy 4005. 4005 and 4006 kind of go together. So one is for the selection of principals and the other one is vice principals. They're pretty much identical with a few differences. And the only update on here was to actually reflect the board motion, which was the person responsible to hire principals, vice principals, ultimately to superintendent of schools. 
So that was a previous motion, and that had not been updated since that motion that the board um, was going to be involved in the selection process, but the, uh, the final decision is the superintendent. So that's essentially what this reflects with cleaning up from the old language. Yes, I would like to make a motion that policy 4005 and policy 4006 uh, be withdrawn and referred to the governance um, session of the board to be brought back to a uh, meeting in uh, a board meeting in in uh, September. Second the motion for discussion. Okay. Uh, <coughs> any additional comments, Rick? Before. Um, so no, I think now? that um, for certainly um, three brand new trustees and myself returning trustee, uh, I think we need to have a little bit of discussion uh, regarding uh, the, the policy and uh, just get a clearer view and, and just bring it back. I, I think uh, that would be uh, prudent in, in this case. I, I actually think that... In at the time we in we earlier passed a motion talking about the um, involvement in the board in hiring different positions. I felt at the time there were we were making quite a significant mistake in in the board continuing to have authority over the hiring of, of a number of positions other than the superintendents. And uh, and the argument was that what what the policy that we changed at the time was simply to reflect practice. Mm -hmm. And I feel that it is not a very good practice that we have now, you know, created a policy that the, the language of which reflects policy uh, practice. But I actually think we do need to have a discussion about whether it is a practice which is which is right and effective in a modern organization. So I think it could be an issue that would benefit from having a broad discussion at the at a, a governance meeting about where exactly does the board's role stop in terms of hiring other staff. And that then it might result in the passing of this motion and then amendment of the other. Who knows where it would go. Dr. Okay, I just ask for some clarification. Certainly we'd be glad to take all of this stuff mm -hmm. to a governance competition. Just wanted to um, ask that if that's the intention um, it, it, uh, in the understanding that the current, this current policy has been superseded by a policy that the board that has been that the board previous board voted on, which is that um, uh, board of education is responsible for the hiring of directors and above. Right. So that's the current policy we live in. Mm -hmm. And you I did, which, which reflected the conversation that you actually were speaking to. Mm -hmm. um, this simply was cleaning up these policies as they exist, mostly around the assignment to principals and vice principals, mm -hmm. not the selection of. And so we're glad to put that all back. But currently we, we exist in a policy that says this Board of Education um, hires directors and above. So I would suggest that we should bring that policy as well back to a governance conversation in the event that you want to change that. Right? Now, my, and, until, and in the absence of that, I will, I will as I'm in the process of the selection and, and uh, appointment, <laughs> assignment to principals and vice principals, move within the current policy as it exists until you might change it. Am I correct? That, Great. Good. That would be my and understanding. I can add then we'll bring that the, the existing policy back, which is um, as I as stated uh, about a year ago, there was the change. <coughs> but in the absence, we'll go by that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That would so be my assumption, yeah. uh, Mr. Great. Chair. Thank you. All right. So everybody's clear on the motion? No, I'm even more confused now. The motion. <laughs> so can you reread the motion? Policy 4005 and 4006. He withdrawn and referred to board governance for discussion, then brought back to the board. Okay. Okay. Any questions? All those in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we need a motion to get direction to also? Bring that other motion. I can take that as a direction. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, 
policy 5001, hiring of support staff? Yes, it used to be hiring of support staff, but it's been updated to hiring of unionized staff. What was rescinded were a manager of regulation that didn't reflect practice, but we thought it would be wise to have policy wording around it. And it's not just for support staff, it's all unionized staff. So that's what has been changed in terms of the practice of the board and the hiring of unionized staff and each year consultation about process with the union in terms of the staffing timeline and spring staffing and essentially the current practice that we have every year. And this was just captured in policy so that everybody is clear that it's for all union staff and this is how we, and that we believe in fair and transparent process and hiring the best person for the job as it reflects the policy. So that is just an update to clean up and reflect our practice. Can I have a motion on that? Second. Any discussions? No? All those in favor? And that's carried. And then policy 100601, trustee travel budget. I would like to add an amendment, please. On the, is underneath the meetings, there are, there's actually the fall December academy needs to be added to that. So I make a motion to amend the policy to add the fall December academy. It's usually in December, sometimes in the fall. So if you do the fall, it's not December, if you cover it. Okay. We have a seconder. Trustee Grimm, any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? I'm sorry, I didn't hear about policy amendments. So on, underneath the meetings, under where it says board planning sessions to add fall slash December academy. This isn't in the motion, it's in the actual policy. This is within the policy. Okay, as amended. Yeah, policy is to amend. So I'll move the, move the motion as amended. Discussion? I just have to say that you will notice that 1999, our trustee travel budget hasn't changed. In comparison to other districts, we are very prudent, fiscally responsible, and our expenses are actually on the low end. So I just like to acknowledge that we do watch our dollars. Thank you for the unpaid political amendment. Hey, we're very responsible. I just want to let people know that. And all those in favor of the motion as amended? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll move in receipt of the policy advisory committee report. So moved. Seconder? Seconder. All those in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Education committee. Receipt of the minutes. Make a motion to receive the minutes. Second. Any discussion? I'd like just to acknowledge the presentations we had from the Strong Start program. They were awesome. I want to go back to preschool and take my grandchildren there. It's incredible. And thank you, Director Douglas, for arranging that. It was very informative. And our next meeting is going to be Tuesday, May the 8th at Highland Secondary School from 630 on. And the public is more than welcome to come. And thank you to DPAC for coming out. I appreciate DPAC attendance. Thank you. So we'll move receipt of the report. I did. Oh, you did? I did. All those in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Transportation committee meeting. I can see that it's noted that the next meeting is May the 7th. That's right. It is noted that. I think that we had a meeting. Thank you. We'll move on to board appointees. Start of bodies. Committee structure. The Columbia Institute Center for Civic Governance has their forum on March 30th and 31st. And Sheila McDonald attended that. Oh, it was very interesting. Well, I have forwarded you a link from Bruce Bristow for the Finnish BBC 
Finland, and you'll find when you go to the YouTube link, there are immediately about 45 other examples of the Finland model. And you could spend quite a bit of time watching and exploring educational directions. Otherwise, it was very interesting, and there is some other material that will be available for trustees to look at. Thank you. Any comments or questions for Trustee McDonald? Thank you. I move on to correspondence. Some correspondence in your package on page 57, which is something that the board deals with on an annual basis. So I move that the board support a full page ad in the annual memorial service recognition to include the amount of $15.95. I have a seconder. Second. Any discussion? I think this falls, for me, I see this one. I see the, you know, 25-page document that the TOEs put out with full of ads and everything, and I see this pile of paper that's now going to come back to us in September with a whole bunch more stuff, and I just think, couldn't we contribute to their website instead of to printing that document one more year? So not to diminish the value of their service and our commitment to everything that our Army, Air Force, et cetera, have done and the importance of remembering this, but it is not, in my mind, an effective way to approach the board resources. I'm just going to say that. Yeah, I think just my comment would be that, first of all, the majority of the distribution goes to seniors and senior centers, et cetera, and many seniors don't have access to websites, et cetera. So this is the best of both worlds. It may not be the best solution. However, it is a resource, and it's something that seniors can read in various locations, and so the distribution of it is free, and it gives an opportunity for seniors to be reading up on military recognition of other people. And so, consequently, I agree with you that it would be nice to have it on a website, and it would probably reduce the cost as well. But for the time being, that's somewhat restricted. So having it in print form has the ability to get out to more people, and that's simply the bottom line. Any additional comments? Just a reminder, if I could, that our students contribute to what goes in. So this poem on the back was a student from our district. Yes. And so that's really good. And there's what, depending on, it sort of varies year to year, but there's always at least a number of classes that do written pieces for submission, and there's always a number of classes from our high schools that do an artistic graphic design piece as well, and then they choose from that. So, yes, perhaps in the more modern world we'll be looking at graphic design that is lifted to a website, and certainly text can be as well, but I didn't want it to be missed that our students contribute to our, they are the designers of our portion of the page. And it's a pretty meaningful thing for them. Thank you. Call the question. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Five, four, one abstention. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of the meeting. We'll have some time for questions and inquiries from the public. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
it appears as if this board has a more kind of different style of governance or management. For example, the district budget used to be a topic of discussion at nearly all board meetings, and information related to the budget used to be presented openly to the public. For example, in January 2011, staffing budgets for schools were announced at that month's public meeting. In February of that year, over 10 pages of the board's agenda package included details of the budget, and in March of that year, there were 28 pages of information presented publicly, which included funding announcements, details of capital projects, and so on. So far under this board, until today, we haven't had one word about the budget presented or discussed publicly. At last month's board meeting, you have a spot on the agenda for the Secretary-Treasurer report, but you skip over that. I was confused about why that happened. What's the cause of that? And now today we have a brief report verbally from Ron Amos about the deficit, representing $1.3 to $1.7 million, a significant amount, which is going to have a huge impact on children and support service in the district. Yet we're only here about it now, and the public process is obviously going to be a phony consultation process because we know that 90% of the budget is spent on staffing, and 99% of the staffing decisions have already been made because we're entering the staffing process right now. So budgets have been cut from across the district for support services. School budgets have been allocated already around staffing. So any kind of process that happens in May would merely be an information process, not a consultation. They're going to tell us what happened, but there will be no consultation. There will be no why you do it that way, and is there any other opportunity to change that? Those decisions have already been made. Well, in May, we'll be in the round one by that time. So those decisions seem to be a major flaw. I'm just wondering if you'll comment on whether that is particularly a style of choice you've made to keep that information out of the public eye, or why we're not receiving complete details of the budget at a public meeting where people can see them and discuss them and know all the details. I'll stop there, and then I've got some follow-up for sure. So thank you for the question. It's always good to get feedback on how the style of the board is perceived. What I can say is that this board will develop and maintain its own style, whether it stays static as it's been for the last three months or evolve over the next three years. I can't predict. That's really something that is dependent upon the entire board. I can say that there certainly has been no intent on my part as a board chair or on any of my colleagues to restrict information that is coming out. I think it's good feedback to hear that there's a sense that there are pieces of information that are missing that perhaps weren't there in the past. I certainly take that under advisement and will do that with my colleagues. A follow-up question on that, if you don't mind. And then are we expected to do a freedom of information request to get access to that kind of information that we want to have? If we want to know what the budget entails, if we want to know the staffing form of the school, are we expected to ask to do a freedom of information request, or will that be forthcoming in the future? That will be absolutely forthcoming. So no need for a freedom of information request. No, because I would say to you that later on, I think we were probably going to say the same thing. This has been a different year for us completely in budgeting. We are used to having all kinds of Ministry of Education funding information anywhere between January and the middle of March, and we are still incomplete with information coming from the Ministry in two or three major categories. And they are the kind of categories that speak to the difference between a $1.3 million and a $1.7 million, like almost a half a million dollar swing. We are not getting the same kind of information from the Ministry within the same timelines that we have historically gotten. That's not a blame piece. It's just the reason. It's not an excuse. It's just the reason. Part of the reason why we are delayed in the whole budgeting process is there have been and continue to be unknowns. Am I correct? Absolutely, yeah. And just to, again, it's been a strange year in terms of the labor unrest and in terms of some of the program changes that have occurred, some of the funding changes that have occurred. 
And a lot of the information we think got late, even in, like I said, even in the, Mar the uh, March 13th announcement, many of the information hadn't even been released after that. And so you're going into the next two weeks after the 13th of sort of um, understanding the implications as the ministry sort of changes their tune sometimes, and sometimes they are looking back at some of those questions that are being raised. Um, many school districts um, did go public very quickly with very quick announcements, are now sort of recanting. So it's certainly the, our approach um, has been fairly um, slow, absolutely, but we wanted to get the message right. Um, what, like I said, what you're finding is the initial reaction to the budget and or to the funding announcements was shock and awe of, I call it a perfect storm, but of, of a number of uh, ministry initiatives that were hitting the budget model all at once. And they were choosing, and they were picking and choosing a lot of the, their to-do lists um, that they wanted to, um, to initiate or whatever. They used this year to do it all. So you had a, a, an awful lot of items that were coming down, um, talked about from the ministry's direction, but not necessarily shared with the, uh, that they would act upon it. So certainly this has been at the intention of this of the budget release, the information being released, was intended to, do, to go slowly because we wanted to make sure that we had our facts right. And we wanted to know the implications that it meant to our programming and what it meant to our, our staffing because we didn't want to go down the road and have to uh, do last minute adjustments or to do um, unfounded um, surprises to the, to the system itself. Uh, so absolutely, it was intended to stage this out over time, and unfortunately, we couldn't get ahead of it any sooner than we have been. Um, but that was our the approach that we chose. Any other questions? I think there's another follow up to that, if you don't mind. Um, I think the public has a right to know then what are the enrollment forecasts for our schools next year? What are the FDE staffing for the school? Are the kindergarten primary classes going to be staffed at when you, because this has all been decided, are you staffing them at 21 or 22 each school, which used to be the maximum, does that now become the average or the, the target number um, for kindergarten and 24 for kindergarten classes from grade 1 to 3? Um, what formula was used for those things? We'd like to know uh, how those decisions were made, because those decisions were already made. Um, those decisions have not all been made because the whole process has been held up. We um, certainly have been moving ahead as much as possible um, with the rollover, the rollover standards. We haven't changed that significantly in any way. So as I had said earlier in my presentation, we aren't staffing at elementary any differently than we ever have. Um, and we, the numbers for K-3 were stayed the same. So those K numbers are the same. Nothing changed this year. So it isn't a surprise. It wasn't meant to be a conspiracy or it wasn't kept from anybody in particular. The implications of the lift fund have significantly changed our divisions in elementary. We were initially, as Ron said, the lift fund was announced, but nobody had the operating manual attached to it. And we were initially thinking we could do some things um, at the front end with the lift funds and to be, be told three weeks later around divisions at elementary, which was a staffing issue, as you would say, and then we told when the final details came out, you had to spend all of your money first and then you could, you could then you could, so we had to we had to shift that whole model around. So it's not been delivered at all. The staffing pieces um, that we have been sure of, we have moved on, and we're still at secondary as of today, still having conversations with secondary schools about staffing blocks. And in fact, I, I have this little, it's getting thinner all the time. I, we were still allocating staffing blocks for basic baseline staffing as of today, Steve. It wasn't that we had, been, had it all done mm -hmm. four weeks ago and didn't share it. So absolutely, there's no, we have, we have no, we will share that information as we have. We haven't historically always shared it in the board. The previous board shows a different way of doing that, sharing that. Um, we have always shared it at the school level historically um, with either staff committees or staff reps as secondary schools have gone into staffing. There's nothing to hide there. We can certainly share that information. And we just wanted to make sure we were active. That's all. And so certainly you will get that information. And you would get it as the union president if you asked me for it without a 
a freedom of information request. That's never been the intention. It's still so... What's the word? Tentative. That's a better word than I was going to choose. It's still so tentative right now around everything, particularly the lift funding, about what we can and cannot do, and can we add, can we go into the lift fund for an extra half a teacher in an inner city school to release some pressure in divisions and those kinds of things that we've been trying to get that as accurate as we can. So certainly we would like to be able to present a pretty solid piece of work, and she was working this week with secondary principals, as I said, in order to prepare for and running parallel to this as the staffing process, and we'll share with you what we have. It's not complete yet, though. Now, this district has historically, this is one of those no good deed goes unpunished events. This district has historically staffed school, done their staffing months before most districts across the province, and that's a good thing. There's a benefit to that. Parents, kids, teachers, and QP staff members in particular, those folks get to know sooner than later, but in most districts, they're just starting now, and they will staff through May and June and into July sometimes, and this year, because we um, were caught by this shift from a rollover to a $1.3, $1.7 million deficit, um, one of the things that has been difficult is managing the early staffing processes that we usually start in January here, which most folks don't start till April. Right? They kind of, you know, there's been a couple of intersections where they run into each other because we simply haven't had the information in the perfect storm from the ministry. Not intentional at all. But we'd rather get it right, and we all know, and as a union president, Stephen, you know this, it's easier to add staff than to take staff away once they've been given positions. And we've been trying to avoid that. Any questions? I'm just wondering what the plan, I'm concerned, my daughter's in grade 7 um, this year, she's paying to go to Starkville, but the kids have been fundraising and doing all sorts of stuff. And now the question, of course, is where are we at? It's conflicting information out there. I'm wondering at what point and how far in advance will we know whether things are going ahead? If they're going ahead, what the, the makeup kind of is as far as um, uh, supervision goes. Um, of course, being concerned that there's a limited amount of parents that are, you know, that struck home and wants there because it is uh, life skills that they're learning. Um, we, of course, want to make sure that after 2.30 there's still supervision, but it just goes ahead. Just wondering when we will get that kind of information. I could answer that, but I think I got turned that over to um, Mr. Douglas because there is a meeting coming up that we might want to talk about. So, on Thursday, thank you. It is one of the items on our agenda. Okay, um, there are a lot of issues around the Shannon, and uh, in all of our elementary schools, there's all these year-end field trips that have been planned and prepared for. And now, as this new decisions come around about not participating in extracurricular activities, the landscapes change for many of these activities when we were planning them in the beginning. And we certainly know that um, these overnight trips can't proceed if we don't have teachers there. Our administrators cannot step in and do all of this on their own and run the school at the same time. And the use of parents um, in place of teachers just isn't going to be a workable situation. So there's going to be some adjustments. There's going to be some certainly disappointed children and some disappointed uh, There'll be some disappointed teachers too, and uh, parents. Uh, but we will discuss this. We will work through this, and uh, it might look a little differently. For example, maybe instead of staying overnight on Columbia Island, as many schools do, they can go for the day. I know this sounds crazy, but maybe they have to come back that night and go back again the next day, and they'll miss the overnight camp. We just put ourselves so far out on the liability uh, line if we go and we don't have uh, teachers. We rely on our teachers to be our supervisors overnight. There's lots of things happen potentially on those trips. 
And I know that's probably not the answer you wanted to hear, seeing as how your child's going on one of these trips. Well, but me, I mean, of course, you know, I, I mean, yes, I'm frustrated. I'm not going to point to anything here. Um, I just want to be able to prepare my child as far in advance as possible. That's all that I'm looking for is, is I want to be able to go home and say, start, you know, getting your head set around what the changes are going to be. No, I just finished off is that we're aware of, we're aware of this. Um, and we're going to have to do, we're, we're trying, it's a real balance between being consistent so that we're fair, so that, because, but at the same time, it's almost, in some other instances, field trips and schools and communities are unique enough that it's going to have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. And it's going to be, from our perspective as district leaders, and certainly as school-based leaders, but also on the parts of staffs and parents, it's going to be, how can we minimize, on one hand, the effect of the extracurricular ban? for kids and, and all that that does for them, those, those activities do for them towards the end of the year. How do we minimize that as much as possible? Can we find middle ground, as Alan describes? Can we do something that still encases most of the experience, but not maybe some of the pieces that we can't supervise? And at the same time, can we um, minimize for kids, but also understand that it isn't business as normal? And it can't be because major participants in these in these events are missing. And as I said earlier, somewhere, um, it isn't just about replacing the bodies. Um, it isn't just about saying that there were six teachers that were maybe going to be present at this time, and now there's only one or there's none, and we'll just find six bodies to replace them around the supervision. Part of the beauty of these activities and the purpose is about the relationship that those kids have with the teachers, the teachers have with those kids. And if we want to we want to honor that. That's important. And it isn't so it isn't just simply as um, finding six volunteers that will fill those spots. Teachers um, believed in these activities and, I, and, it, and it's a difficult decision for them, I'm sure, not to attend. And I'm sure that the relation piece and the connection pieces were important to them. And, and volunteers picked out of, a, out of a pack will not be able to, to provide that same kind of experience for kids. So we're going to try and balance that the best we can, find middle ground as much as possible, do it in a timely way so that parents and students and teachers can process what that looks like and um, we're going to do our very best to get through that, Oper I'm operationalizing it in a way that's consistent, but also recognizing that there's going to be some individual and unique things that will need to be looked at individually. Like something, someone asked me a question about an activity, and I went, oh, okay, that's the only school where that's happening. It's quite unique. I, we need to have an answer for that. But that answer for that school will be different, because I don't think any other school is going to do one of those. So we'll just have to deal with those. But we're on it. We're starting on Thursday. Right? Now, just around the fundraising piece, being that the kids have spent so much fundraising, where is that money? How is that all being worked So that's the kind of things that principals are going to look at. Because part of it depends on, it's again, a case-by-case -case basis. In some cases, we may have to run, refund money to students <laughs> because they're in grade 7 and no longer going to be connected to that school. In other cases, maybe the best case scenario is that that money is held in that, you know, that grade 6 student's name and trust for the next school year when something else comes and that fundraising money goes towards that. So always be, you know, and make, doing everything we can to ensure that the students that will be affected by this have either have an opportunity to gain that experience again at another time, or if they're leaving us for some reason, that they're, they're honoring that they contributed this much money and that there's certainly that money gets, gets connected to them as they leave somehow. Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconder? Second. All those in favor? We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.